Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you, Cosmin, and thank you, Freya, for the invitation. And uh, although I was, I'm supposed to be talking uh, about exhibitions and fiction, I think, and that's what I'm gonna do. I think there's still like uh, very like interesting overlaps between uh, my presentation and the, dis the previous discussion we we just had. So we'll see where this leads us. One fine autumn morning, James Lee Byers went to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, put his hat on the counter at the reception, and slammed his his hand down on it before having it sent to the museum's then curator, Dorothy C. Miller, to announce his arrival. The squished white hat and a note by Miller setting the event around the year 1965 are the only traces left of a gesture that, like much of Bayer's work, was carefully planned. For the 10th day of the 10th month at 10 in the morning, that's 10, 10, 10. With actions like, with actions like this one, the artist wanted to achieve perfect symbiosis between a tribal everyday life event and an, and, and an event that by capturing our attention, if only momentarily, could have an extraordinary impact. Just as his hat was soon to become an icon indissociable from his persona, Bayer's relationship with Miller would quickly reveal a series of interests and concerns that came to define the rules of a game that Bayer's eventually implemented in his practice. These rules determined the relationship between a body of work that the artist always wanted to leave open to external influences and what he hoped might become an ever-changing institutional space. He went so far as to imagine in 1968 a fictional museum that would no longer shelter art objects, but instead millions of minutes of attention. Over the years, Byers raised a series of questions about the, the, artist's, roles, the artist's role as a catalyst for aesthetic experience, about the nature of, create, of the creative gesture as an agent of change, and about the conditions of a work of art's existence, displacement and survival within historical continuum. On the one hand, in his creation of an artistic persona, he deliberately left behind few traces or personal archives, fostering the creation of a myth that allowed him to disseminate his works as if they were messages, rumors, and legends that were often very difficult to authenticate. On the other hand, he sent countless letters to friends and acquaintances, which, like the hat, now help us bridge the gap that exists between his artwork, most often ephemeral and elusive, and its documentary evidence. It is pre precisely in this kind of liminal spaces that a show-like exhibition JLB operated. This was a one-year exhibition organized in 1981 by Vis Mols, then director of the Apple, in Amsterdam, in close work collaboration with the artist. Byers, who never made himself present in the show, nevertheless set the rules of the game through his ep epistolary practice, sending the instructions for his works to be performed and for the performances to be discussed in the aftermath of their making. By considering the relationship between the moment in which an exhibition is conceived and the way in which it is received, that is, the relationship be between historical time and social space, Byers explored the relevance of making and narrating history outside of the immediate context of the work's production. The exhibition, taken not as an end, but clearly as a medium, allowed him to attain an autonomous realm in which facts and tales, veracity and deception were constantly at play. Far beyond the dematerialization of his works, the underlying gist of the show had to do with the way in which it shifted in terms of time and place, and with how, since early on, the dissemination of oral history, history directly impacted the survival of Bayer's practice within a historical chronology. Dorothy Miller was the one supposed to have organized Bayer's first exhibition in an American museum. That was the Museum of Modern Art, a show that only lasted a few hours, and that in rumor, at least, took place on the MoMA's fire escape in 1958. Whether fact of, or fiction, there remains no physical trace of this exhibition, but only a series of letters written by buyers over time that recall, recall it as an achievement in his career. This mythical show, which allegedly took place in the peripheral spaces of the founding agency of the history of modern Western art, demonstrates Bayer's strategic understanding of, of institutional context, an understanding that goes hand in hand with his interest in employing alternative formats for the presentation of his pieces and performances, which in the long term allowed him to explore the mechanisms used to frame and legitimize an artwork. 
Years later, in 1964, Byers anonymously and strategically donated some of his performable paperwork to MoMA. These pieces were then activated in the winter, in the winter of 1965-1966 at the Carnegie Museum, a performance that he never attended again. In a letter he sent to Gustav von Groschwitz, then director of the Department of, of Fine Arts at the Carnegie, Byers discusses these performances and tells him about his excitement after visiting the primary structure show. Though he had not been invited to take part in this exhibition, he still considered the possibility of infiltrating it and utilizing its, resi its residual spaces to activate, at the spur of the moment, some of the performable paper pieces. I quote, I may appear in it as a daily anonymous white configuration and every day different. By trying to operate on the margins of the institution and manifesting himself as a ghostly anonymous figure, most likely an invisible one, Byers questioned not only the ways in which spaces of legitimation operate, but also the terms under which, in the long term, historical memory is constructed and preserved. Here, as it happened with his MoMA exhibition, there is no proof that any of this took place, other than the letters that he wrote testifying about his interest to perform his pieces that way. In that sense, writing an ephemera became an important vehicle for Byers to make his intentions known, but also to narrate the aftermath of his performances as they were supposed to have taken place or as he wished them to be remembered. Byers had, had started developing this strategy early on when he wrote a short text uh, titled Accomplishments in 1964. That was a grant application for the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. Written like a CV, Accomplishments recounts Byers' various achievements since 1961. Amongst them, a four-minute exhibition at the Kyoto Imperial Palace grounds, exhibitions at Green at Castel and Castelli, and one exhibition at 200 East 88th Street, which was done by stating the possibility and cancel. He implied thereby that the eventuality that something may happen was more important than the event itself. Various projects throughout his career played with these boundaries between fact and fiction deliberately, like the fictional PhD he got from the University of Santa Cruz, which he says inspired his performance, the World Question Center, or the fictional museum that he decided to set up in New York City to show the, millions, the, million, the million minutes of attention that he would collect from people. Out of many of these events, not much survives but references in, in his letters and, and invitation cards multiples and ephemera di distributed to people on the street, all of which make possible a reconstruction and dissemination of history as Byers well knew. Later on, he wrote Mr. Byers and a Dozen Facts, a document that stood as a biographical note for the Made in Paper exhibition that took place in the streets of Manhattan in 1967. This time, the document lists his birth date, studies, and, and interests, as well as the proclivities that, along with the concept of question and the idea of perfection, were to inform his art practice in very specific ways from that time forward. So I quote from the document, favorite sight, water, favorite sound, O, favorite touch, silk. With this, Byers dissociated his public persona from his private self, talking about himself in the third person. He did this again a year later for his show, Mr. Byers and Sixth Place. This time he distributed the text, Mr. Byers and 12 Facts, a short biography, listing personal details and recounting career highlights. And I quote from the document, first show was in the Firescape of MoMA in 1958, displayed 100 propositions at the Geographical Center of America, etc. The press bulletin then describes some of the actions that were to take place during the show. Though these were conceived as succinct performative interventions for, pub for a public space, like having 500 people walk around the block, allegedly naked with their heads poking through a communal red garment, and accompanied by a quintet that played uh, Johann Sebastian Bach fugue, they were also meant to be total experiences that addressed the senses and extended beyond the actions immediate spatial, spatial context. That is why, after they finished the action, participants were invited to a cocktail party where the garment was cut into portions for groups of five, which they could then take home. But they could also come back the day after and discuss, discuss their experiences among themselves. Calling these actions plays, based, he said, on the multiple definitions of the word in the Oxford Dictionary of the time, Byers meant that these performances 
were to be seen equal, equally as games, mise-en-scene, and narrations. Shortly afterwards, Byers did another communal garment entitled The Pink Silk Airplane. And he stated, I quote, the airplane-shaped garment could be considered a soft sculpture, it could be considered a theater, it could be considered a dress. I use it in all different ways. The versatility of, the ver versatility of pieces like this one, a piece for which people were expected to breathe all at the same time and thus fly, enabled him to go from one discipline to another and let him ask things like, and I quote him again, what does pretend mean? How long can you pretend? That is a question that Byers went on exploring over the years, not only under the guise of his art artistic persona, but also de developing a practice that was less dependent on his presence than on the conceptual frame imagined by the artist and on the spectator's willingness to participate and play along the rules set by him. As we know, Byers went, went from deliberate anonymity when he donated his early works to MoMA at the beginning of the 1960s, to developing an artist persona as he later as he later aspired to become a work of art himself, and even more, began delimiting a framework in which his work could function and be legitimized, uh, uh, referring to himself as an exhibition since, as he stated, one kind, one's kind of living is to be considered a show. Byers not only clearly established an equivalency between himself and the artistic event by exploring the exhibition as a way of staging four-minute shows, or shows involving 18 days in movement, he also went on to conceive different exhibition formats, such as a retrospective of his work as an hour-long show, thus editing the retelling of his life to a, uh, down to a momentary experience, or the opposite, prolonging one of his shows into a year-long affair that, it, that essentially operated as a rumor as it happened with exhibition JLB. Exhibition JLB run this is the invitation card, ran from the very first to the very last moment of the year, I'm quoting the text. Its peculiarity being that the artist, the artist was never there. As the, as the invitation card read, a foundation, the Apple, will commission James Lee Byers in the year 1981 to, in his absence, make himself present. The opening reception took place in conjunction with New Year's, with New Year's celebration at the Palm House or, uh, of the Orticus Botanicus, a greenhouse where champagne was served along with fortune cookies, containing quotes about, this is a very tiny image, but there's another one following. Um, along with fortune cookies, containing quotes about presence and absence from figures like William Shakespeare, Jonathan Swift, Cole Porter, Marguerite Duras, and Byers himself, among others. In addition, the perfect kiss, the perfect cheek, the perfect fragrance were performed. Following this, Byers continued sending instructions to Smalls and her team, which all revolved about, around his absent or invisible figure, testing thereby both the limits of reality and the reach of narration. On April 9 at 7 p.m., seven employees whispered Byers' names, Byers name in front of the building of the Apple Art Center as if invoking the artist. On July 29th, the Apple addressed a request to Her Majesty the Queen of the Netherlands, asking whether JLB may become her personal artist. After considering it on August 8th, she gave a negative reply. Then came The Great Play of Rice, written with golden letters on an eight meter long strip of red paper. And I quote, I want a, I want a thousand gold chairs, although a hundred white will actually do. The queen must have a majestic loan. All the chairs simply in a row. Guests are invited. At the exact moment, all slightly lift their feet off the ground about an inch and immediately down. No, no evidence of this remains. On August 23, for the very great search of James Lee Byers, all those in attendance looked for the missing artist around the botanical garden. For the show's closing night, a young man went from door to door announcing the presentation of the perfect question to city residents, a performance for which Byers had sent the following instructions. Dear W and J, that's uh, V. Smalls and Josine Van Doffelaar, to end our elegant year with a perfect question, the botanical garden is ideal. So here's how W, you read this instruction. One, the perfect question is a printed book with imaginary covers. You and Josine, 
uh, you and Josin pass out to the question. Hold between thumb and index finger out flat. Open the covers carefully. Keep talking your formal speech. Only quietly, quietly. This is a normal classic. Q is O. Listen, you hear O in the atmosphere? Do say only once the four question sentences. Do not explain more, they tell all. Be very polite. Thank you, thank you. These are secret instructions to you, only you and Josine. Do not show to anyone, please. It is with projects like this, this one being probably one of the most ambitious of its kind, that Bayer seems to have explored the relevance of making and narrating history outside of the immediate, immediate context of the work's production. Indeed, for him, our practice manifested itself as an open-ended questioning, eventually looking for answers in the exploration of the possibilities of achieving perfection, even at the expense of its own disappearance. For of these and other actions, there only remains somewhat purposely the invitations cards to the events, the postcards and letters addressed to Smalls and Van Droffelaar, sending his secret instructions, and a few photographs, many of them post photographs, that, appear in the Apple, that appeared in the, the Apple Press Bulletin along with the chronology of the show and a text written by Paul Hefting in which the author states, so this is the, the um, cover of the bulletin. So, uh, so the, the bulletin uh, contained a chronology of the show and a text written by Paul Hefting in which he states, what remains for us are questions, the intuition and the longing, the playing with perfection, giving form to the invisible, a visual theater. So this is uh, like the interior pages of the, of the bulletin where you see some of the images I, I showed before. On the left, you can see like more uh, images of the opening night with the uh, champagne and, and fortune cookies. And then the text and on the bottom of the pages runs the, the chronology. There also remains an edition of cards printed with a picture of the botanical garden that were meant to help anyone interested in the various actions that had taken place in the, in the framework of the show to make an appointment with Smalls to discuss the questions raised by them. Byers again employed the strategy that he had adopted during his show at the Architectural League that allowed, it, that allowed the work to have reverberations outside of the immediate sphere of the event and the performative moment. Byers, in the meantime, inquired as to whether anyone had, had taken his photograph while he wasn't there and insisted that and insisted that were anyone to ask about him, they should be told that he had just left. He had also implemented this strategy before when he organized the performance Open America in 1977 with the help of Richard Bellamy from the extinct Green Gallery and his friend, the art historian David Sewell, an event which occurred simu simultaneously at two distinct locations, the 50th floor of buildings in New York City and Los Angeles, and which buyers never attended. The only thing that remains of this event is the recording that Sewell made of it in real time in Los Angeles. Faced with a specific question posed by the visitors of where the artist was, Sewell answered that he had just left, when Byers was actually sitting at a nearby restaurant waiting for the event to end. As Byers would la later state, the important aspect of the piece was not its organization, the image of two buildings and then nothing other than just the thought that you had open America at either end of the country at the same time, it's nice. But but that is not a great accomplishment. The greater accomplishment is just the thought, of that, the thought of that. All of the efforts of getting people, the vocal invitation and so forth, are just to provide a context. In other words, what Byers valued abo above all was the idea of simultaneity and how it might allow people to suspend their disbelief while they par participated in a collective experience. That is the very idea of pretending, somehow responding to the, the, the inquiries first posed by the pink, sink, the pink silk airplane and later by, by the play of rice. The fact that people thousands of miles apart could be connected based on the principle of psychological communion, something that he had already brought in his communal garments presented at the Architectural League and in the World Question Center or even in This is the Ghost of James Lee Byers Calling, which itself took place simultaneously in Antwerp and Los Angeles, opened up the spectrum of communication and extended the scope of his performances and exhibitions that operated in, a, in an autonomous imaginary realm. As Byers stated, 
the fact that his presence manifested itself as a rumor was quite sufficient an exhibition. After he presented Open America, Bayer stated that, increased, uh, I quote, increasing inventions have occurred, for example, for me to be in both places at the same time. That is an old and interesting wish of, of immortality and things of that sort. I am naive enough to believe that things like that might even start to occur, especially if you start taking yourself as an interrogative in a physical description of a quasi-rigid whirling vortex. End quote. We know that after the World Question Center, Byers developed the first total interrogative philosophy, a dictum of sorts that became the most important guideline for his practice that constantly revolved around the idea of question. And for him, I quote again, the highest reality statement that appears as one type of nuclear mood or attitude. On the one hand, it associated the interrogative character of his work with his fascination for quantum physics, that is for how matter or indeed thought, behaved on an invisible level, was subjected to high energy levels or speeds. On the other hand, it led him to speculate on the possible disappearance of bodies, as idea of bodies, as ideas continue to circulate more quickly. This is what a piece such as Byers at the Met Invisibly that he did in 1971 refers to. And this is the, the invitation part to, to that show. Obviously, here you lose the, um, like the scale of it, but the, like the white paper might be maybe two centimeters, like a two centimeters by two, and of course, like the, the text is, is barely visible. Here, the artist alleges that he ran after his audience outside the museum so fast that he became invisible. Of course, no proof of this remains. His interest in dissolution and invisibility also refers to the splitting of his persona and his growing interest over the years in exploring liminal spaces between the visible and the invisible, rumor and written la language, legend and history, fact and fantasy, life and death. It is at these thresholds where one must situate the sort of amalgam between science and fiction through which buyers seem to enjoy spectrally traveling and of which exhibition JLB is a fine example projecting himself through fleeting embodiments and documentations of his own work, Byers was able to continually self-manifest, even posthumously, in the 20th century of art history, undermining the site of art, its material presence, and most in interestingly, the still persi persistent conventions such as exhibitions adopted to frame and legitimize contemporary artistic practice.